Good evening, and welcome to this week's Black Mental Health is Black Health. Now, tonight, you might hear a little background noise because we are starting something new. We're live at and interviewing an author and presenter tonight, and I'll tell you more about her in a moment, but we're at DFW Behavioral Health Symposium. As a mental health professional, I like connecting with other mental health professionals and we have an awesome professional here tonight, live in person. So if you hear background noise, we're at the hotel. But we'll still start off with our breathing. If you've never been on the show before, you might not know, we start every show with deep breathing. Why? Deep breathing allows you to decompress from the day. Even if you had a good day, you might just need that Rusa moment. So we're going to have that Rusa moment together. Let me tell you how it works. I'm going to tell you to breathe in and I'll count to four and we're going to hold it for a count of four. Then I'll tell you to breathe out for a count of four. It's called box breathing. And that's what we're going to do today. Now, are we doing the doctor breathe? Are we doing the... No, I'm breathe? getting ready to tell we're doing the real breathe. Okay. Now, <laughs> so to wait to know you're really breathing in deep, we're going to do a practice breath. Put your hands on your stomach. And when I say breathe in... If you don't feel your stomach expanding, you're not breathing enough. So that's just, this is just a practice breathing. In. Let's go. Breathe in. Two, three, four. <laughs> Out. Two, three, four. Now let's do the box breathing. We're going to hold it in the middle. Let's get started. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. One more. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Out. Two, three, four. How was that for you? I love it. Like I, you know, I never really get to do it for me. I'm mm -hmm. always doing it with my clients. So it's like for me to be able to do it, it's like, oh man, this is a believer. All right. <laughs> so great. If you think it's great, yes. that is awesome. Yes. So as you see, we have Dr. LaFanya Jones Hines with us today. Hello. And she has an amazing curriculum. And we're going to talk about addiction. Something that has touched every family. Somebody, it was not a cousin, your son, your daughter, your mama, your daddy. And Next if you say if it hadn't connect, touched you in any way, you've been living in a closet. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we realize it's real. So as always, I ask my guests to introduce themselves. So tell us who you are, why the topic is important to you, and something cool about you. Okay. So, as she said, I'm Dr. Jones Hines, and I am, uh, I have a private practice located in Euless, Texas, and I work with addicts, family members of addicts, women's issues, and I do diagnostic testing. And my interesting thing is that I love to dance. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, that's what I do to, like, you know, decompress. That's your Wusa moment. My Wusa, yes. yes. <laughs> so about the book, um, I started the book uh, <laughs> after working at a company uh, where I was working with individuals that are uh, using substances. And I did not choose this field. God chose this field for me. <laughs> because, And I say God chose this field for me because I was asleep one night. I had a dream that this company was going to call me and when i woke up i was like what i, I don't even remember applying to this company let me i don't even know if it's a real company because i had mm. never heard of it before and so i looked it up and it was actually a company and when i saw that it was a rehab i was like oh no god this must be for somebody else you want me to give this interpret this for somebody else mm -hmm. but then 10 minutes after i closed my laptop they called me that was God. Right? <laughs> so they called me, asked me, you know, scheduled the interview, and I was still hesitant because I was like, oh, uh, I don't know if I want to do this, you know. But 
I went on the interview, ended up getting a job, and I decided that I would try it. And I, when I, when I got involved, I wasn't sure how I was going to benefit this, you know, this area of mental health mm. because I'm an adult child of an addict. So I didn't know how to be therapeutic. I didn't know how it was going to be therapeutic because those memories I had, you know, back here mm -hmm. in, in my filing cabinet and I didn't want to bring them forward. Right. You we know, keep that file cabinet locked. Locked and throw away the key. I don't mm -hmm. even know what the key is. Mm -hmm. So I worked with the individuals for about four years and I seemed to be good at it. So I was like, okay, so I'm good at it. So let me stick to it. Maybe this is where God wants me mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. So then they told me that the uh, family therapist position in Arizona was available. So I was like, let me try something new. I'm single. Don't have children at the time. I'm married now. But I'm, I was single at the time. Didn't have any children. So I was like, let me go. So I applied. They hired me as the um, family therapist there. And so I went. And then my journey started. So as I started working with the family members, I started off with the worksheets and everything that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I, I didn't know what if this was working, if it was already working, I wasn't going to, you know, try and fix it. But it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I saw that the family, the families that came, they were hurting. They were fearful. Like they, they felt betrayed. They had all these emotions that was kind of just balled up in them. And so I started thinking like, okay, they need something more. So I couldn't just keep working on those worksheets. Mm -hmm. So then what I did was I put everything that I had into researching, into applying things and seeing if they were working. I know it was a hit and miss, but I was trying to see if it was working. And it seemed like it was. So that's why I created the Essential, essential Guide, which is um, Addiction Hurts Everyone, a family's journey to healing. Uh, this is the essential guide, and the essential guide is the the book for the facilitators to use to teach. Um, and so, as I, you know, created the the essential guide, it I started using it, and it was really working. Like I had uh, family family members asking, well, do you have this documented anywhere? We need copies mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And of course I had it documented, but it wasn't published. So it was like, I didn't, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I stopped teaching mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, and that was so after, you could create so it. I could create it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I'll be holding it. So here we are. And let me ask you this about engaging family. Mm -hmm. You the addict. He the addict, not me. Why you why didn't talk to me? Now I'm gonna be the family member. And you, you, you need to I know there's probably somebody out there there in that position. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah. So when I mm -hmm. when I was working with the company, mm -hmm. uh I had a lot of that. And so I my one part of my job duties was to call the family members to get them to participate. I had a lot of well, I I I'm I'm good. I'm fine. I'm he the problem, you need to fix him or keep him. And he really don't need to come back home, okay? And so then what I would say is, why does he need to come back home? He's the problem. He wrecks havoc in his house. He's been in rehab before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how? tell me how you're feeling. I'm good. I don't accept good. Okay, fine. Tell me a real feeling. I'm mad. And I need you to just keep him out of this house. Okay. So you being mad is the reason why I think you need to participate. Because even if you don't talk to him, even if he don't come back home, it doesn't matter. But that mad that you feel mm -hmm. is what you need to work with. I won't be mad if he's not coming back to the house. Yes, you will. Because he ain't in the house now and you're still mad. Okay. So what you want to do? <laughs> and so then that's when they would come. Uh, and some of them would still say, well, I don't know. I'll think mm -hmm. about it and I'll, I'll just give them time. Friday of, uh, you know, because it used to be Friday. I would give them time on Friday, what time we started. And by the time I left, I had 30, maybe 40 families participating. That is awesome. A week. That is awesome. And I do want to make another announcement. I will remind you that the show, we are live at a conference. So if you hear background noise, I had to come to where this lovely lady is. She was presenting on this very topic today, sharing about her book. So I had to come to her. 
So if you hear background noise, it's because we had to be here. <laughs> we had to be together live and in person. Yes. So, I, you know, as you hear noise, I'll remind you, don't worry about it. So yes. you got families to participate. Um, tell me about your story. You said you were the family. Have you, did you ever unlock that fire cabinet before no. I ask this question? How does it, uh, you keep it locked? Does it not bother you or interfere with what you do? So it doesn't. Um, it doesn't bother me, mm-hmm. but I think it doesn't bother me because I had a conversation with my mom. Oh, my mom was the one. Okay. So I had a conversation, and I actually had a conversation with my father because for some time I was angry with my father as well mm-hmm. because I was a child. I didn't know, like, when my parents um, separated or whatnot for that for a period of time because my mom was mm-hmm. active in her addiction, uh, I didn't understand why my father didn't fight to keep her at home. So you went with dad when she was- All of us. So all I have kids two brothers. Went, the kids went with dad mm-hmm. and mom had to go because of her addiction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so that happened. And so my parents reconciled when my freshman year in college. Mm. And so at that time she was not using substances, but she was still drinking alcohol. Uh, however, she eventually stopped drinking alcohol as well. And so when she's, I didn't talk to her about, you know, how the addiction affected me or whatnot until she stopped drinking, uh, because I felt like it would be, it wouldn't be productive if she was still using a substance. Right. So once she stopped using drinking alcohol as well, I told her like some of the memories that I had and just how it affected me that like she wasn't there for my prom to help me get ready for my prom. And how old were you when they split and dad took kids? Uh I was fifteen. Mm-hmm. Uh so yeah, I was I was so I was going to high school. But she had already been using. Right. And so she missed your whole high school. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh you may as well as she missed, missed my, everything middle, up to my me. middle school too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um and so, so after I had that conversation with her, she apologized and and was very sincere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she, not only did she apologize, she apologized and she stayed sober. So a lot of times the difficulty is when family members apologize and then they go back and out and do it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you didn't mean it. Right. So I think that's why I have been able to because I'm, I'm not even sure if the, the memories are locked in the cabinet anymore. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, she apologized and she's still... And I want to say she's been sober. Now, granted, she could probably tell you a different number. Uh, she's probably been sober 25, maybe 25, 30 years now, I guess. So she's never gone back. You know, and one thing about that, her making a sincere apology and not going back, it took the power away from those memories. Mm-hmm. If she were still using, it's like those memories are being challenged yep. every time she uses. But when she does it, the power is gone that they had over you. So yep. it's like, I don't even know if the file cabinet is still there. Right. Because they don't have any power. Left. That's true. That's Question for you. Since mm-hmm. this is your area of expertise, how prevalent um, is addiction like how many families? I know there's some number out there. What is that about families? So statistics say that there are a hundred million or more. Sorry, more than a hundred million families impacted by addiction. Yes, I said a hundred million. I was going to say you said one hundred million families. Yes. Do you think that's it though? No, I think that's just the number that's been reported, or the number that. Because a lot of family members don't think they are being impacted. So, mm-hmm. of course, if they don't think they're being impacted, then, you know, you're not going to, like, say, yeah, that's me. Mm-hmm. And be involved in a program for anybody to get any stats from you or, you know, anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's more. Um, after your presentation today, I was talking to someone who was in there, and they're an adult now, and they didn't know their parent was an addict mm-hmm. for years. So, you know, you talk about family. That. She said as a kid, dad kept it. Mom, but they were functioning alcoholics and the whole family, that one side of the family are functioning alcoholics. And yeah, you say no. Huh? Uh-uh. Tell me, okay, go on. Mm-mm. I say no because first of all, and granted, I know there are people just getting ready to bash me for saying this. Mm-hmm. That functioning alcoholic thing is just an excuse. 
people don't have to use a substance to function. So mm-hmm. how is that? That's that's not that don't match. Mm-hmm. So how, you feel they're not functioning? No, because people because if you are an alcoholic more than or uh, uh, using substances more than likely you don't wake up trying to drink to mm-hmm. get get rid of the headache or the hangover, mm-hmm. or you gonna you got something by your on your nightstand to get you kick started. No, I'll say normal people. Normal people, non addicts, don't have to do that. But if you're a child and you're growing up, that is your norm, and you won't know necessarily know the parents are an addict. So you may not know that they're they're an addict, but you know something's wrong. Not if that's your only measuring stick. And you got a family. Remember, uh, and I, I used to work with at a, a homeless shelter for, and part of the program was mm-hmm. you know people in addiction, mm-hmm. and it was so their norm. They really thought it was normal. Yeah. But you know what? And so I think it depends on the how the dynamics are in the mm-hmm. family. So if it's they know that if dad comes home, mom comes home, brother comes home, and they bumping into walls, they may not know why, mm-hmm. but they know something's wrong. If family comes home and y'all arguing, mm-hmm. and it's like why are they arguing? They just like said that they don't know that mm-hmm. it's. it's at, uh, substances, but they know something's wrong. You see, what I'm saying that's why I'm saying like they make they not they not gonna attach it to right, addiction, right. but they know something's, something's wrong. wrong. Like, even, and that's why she could say that she yeah. didn't know that her father yeah. was an addict. Mm-hmm. He, he, I don't know that's all he did. He yeah. went to work every day. Come home, came home with sleep. Mm-hmm. He was probably intoxicated mm-hmm. or whatever the drug of choice mm-hmm. was. And yeah, that that was the norm, right? And and that's how that's why when I when when people say that I'm like well how did how did you feel with that being absent because mm-hmm. even though he was there mm-hmm. physically emotionally uh, and mentally he wasn't mm-hmm. so that still affected you because you still didn't have mm-hmm. your father present you, you right see what I'm saying and this person was affected by it and when she found out and I, I'm sure you've heard this before when the child learns that this is what's going on they're angry. Oh, yeah. How dare you know you what? Yeah, you've been drinking all this time. All this time? That, that's why you've been mm-hmm. ignoring me. That's why you've been sleeping all this time, and I didn't get any of your attention. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. So there's right. a lot of anger. What in your practice do you still um, deal with addiction? Um, yes. So I had kind of gotten away from it for a little while, just because um, I was building a practice. And you know, when you build a practice, you see everybody, mm-hmm. and so my schedule got completely overloaded with like just other diagnoses mm-hmm. um and also right like right now it's gotten me away from uh addiction a little bit mm-hmm. just a little bit i still have some clients that's, a, that's in mm-hmm. addiction so now i'm trying to get back out in the arena of collaborating with other you know uh, rehabs and programs to have uh families involved if they mm-hmm. need or just you know even if it's just addict involvement i'm trying to get myself back out there because i used like i said i worked at a rehab and i was very involved then Mm -hmm. and so when i first came out and have a private practice i was being referred to and things like that but i kind of COVID hit and so it's like everybody kind of distanced distanced themselves Mm -hmm. themselves and nobody knows who is still where right so i got to get back out and connect you know i wanted to go to the anger issue um which is why i was seeing and you probably see it in other things, but with addiction, how does anger play a role in the family since we're focusing on the family side? What mm. is, where does anger even fit with that? So I usually um, describe it as a secondary emotion, obviously. Mm-hmm. But how I explain a lot of my audience may not know what you mean by secondary emotion. Yes. Okay. Break it down. Okay. So <laughs> secondary emotion. So let me go back. So I wish I had my diagram. So I ex- explained the emotional ladder, right? Mm-hmm. Where you have the primary emotions and that can be sad, hurt, rejection, abandonment. Okay. That's the primary emotion. If you ignore that and suppress that, then it grows. And now you feel overwhelmed, which is also when anxiety can kick mm-hmm. in. You stuff and suppress that. Now you feel frustrated. You stuff and suppress that. Now you feel mad. You stuff and suppress that. Now you're angry. Can I say this one? Mm-hmm. And yes, then you, you stuff do. and suppress that. <laughs> you say you say 
you then become pissed off. Mm -hmm. And so when you get pissed off, that's when you start becoming more physical, more mm -hmm. verbally aggressive, you know, things like that. And what I usually tell my clients is that we have to work you back down the ladder to the primary emotion. Not that you don't feel the anger, because by this time you probably do mm -hmm. feel angry. But we have to figure out the primary emotion so that we can work on the primary emotion. It's like you said, all families are not the same. They're not cookie mm -hmm. cutter. So if they didn't know that it was uh, an addiction in the house, and so now they found out, and now they're angry, they they went straight to anger. But let's go back then. What did you feel like you were betrayed? Mm -hmm. You know, did you feel uh, like they were dishonest with you? You know what I mean? So, like, we have to deal with that so that now that anger can begin to fade away and you can deal with the right emotion and then we can treat the right emotion. Yeah, and so often I'm sure they don't even know the emotion. You know, I, especially mm -hmm. I'm just in anger. I'm, I have climbed the ladder. I'm on the top. I can't see the bottom. I can't see the wrong in front of this one. I am mad. It's soft. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to know. I want them out. They are the problem. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. and, and so usually, so in my office, I have a, um, a clipboard and I have a laminated sheet of fill, uh, mm -hmm. emotions words. And so I just have, I just, everybody know that as soon as they come in my office, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, how are you feeling? And I do that because I want my clients to learn how to, uh, a, a broader emotions vocabulary mm -hmm. and so everybody know to just pick up the uh clipboard because they know i'm going to ask them how are you feeling mm -hmm. and so even if they you're like the client that you're describing even if they say well i don't know i hand them the um mm -hmm. clipboard and i say just take your time just just look and then they start coming up with some um mm -hmm. feelings they say well i feel i feel disappointed or i feel betrayed i feel lost you know, so they they start filtering out and unraveling mm -hmm. those emotions because you, you're right. Sometimes it's so many of them, they can't unravel them to understand which one it is. Like, I just know all of them together feels like anger. Mm -hmm. And so then I start teaching them about like how like disappointment feels in your body. Because I have like some body sensations down at the mm -hmm. bottom of my uh, feeling okay. sheet as, as well. So I, So how does disappointment feel in your body? And so they may say, well, it feels like really tense or, you know, something like that, you know. And so I tell them, OK, so now you know that your disappointment, obviously, and your anger both make you feel tense. So you have to realize that when you're going through this process, you might be feeling disappointed, mm -hmm. not anger. So mm -hmm. we have to deal with that. That's a good way to connect. Now, for, with this, do you work with just adults? in the family is there something for children or? so i just work with adults um it can be translated for children but i think the jargon in here is probably too advanced for children so i would have to definitely uh age appropriate mm -hmm. word it <laughs> so what's the youngest you start with i would say 18. okay yeah so um now i ha i think i have had some 16 year olds maybe but even with them, I count, I'm kind of skeptical because I want, I don't. So when I teach it, mm -hmm. of course, I know how to right. change it up. But I would say for anyone purchasing it and teaching mm -hmm. on their own, I would say 18. And not that nobody else can do that. I'm, because like if you bought this and did did the work with teenagers, you would know how to do that. As well. Right. Someone, yeah, they would. But like you say, they would have to change the language yeah. a little bit. You would have to change the language. But it's, you know, I think it's just someone uh purchased some people purchased the book today and uh one of the ladies was like you already did the work i'm good <laughs> so like let me get all of them because i just want to be able to go in and teach it mm -hmm. and that's and she and they were saying like this is why uh they wanted to purchase it because it just, it's already laid out for them and mm -hmm. it made it seem like it was just simple to teach and simple to learn and it was like just very good tips for them to give out so tell us about the different chapters. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, let me go to the first chapter. Hold on one second. Okay. So the first one is I thought I was alone. And mm -hmm. this one talks about us um, learning what addiction is. The family members learning what addiction is and, it, and learning whether or not you believe it's a family disease. Mm. And Stop for me and go back to that family disease. Okay. I ain't got the issue. I told you. 
Pookie is the problem. Okay, okay. Pookie, we didn't really want Pookie in the family no more. <laughs> and now you're trying to say it's a family disease. That's Pookie disease. You need to leave me out of it. <laughs> so, so, so what the, do you mean by family disease? So it's a family disease because of the psychological, the physical, and emotional pain that the family goes through. If there is, have you ever bought a, a like a bag of potatoes? And once one of them go old, um, go bad, all of them start to go bad, and that's the same thing. Of so we just get rid of Pookie. We won't have no family problem. No, because if you take out the one, how would you know where it started? We know how. How? Because the thing is, Pookie started using for a reason, and I'm not. To say, I'm not mm-hmm. trying to say that it's the family's fault. That that's what he chose to use to, you know, how he chose to cope. To, to cope, but. There's a, a problem in the family, whether or not it's the media family, the extended family, or the whole family. It, it started somewhere. So now we have to figure out just because he's the scapegoat doesn't mean that there's not a problem. It's a domino effect mm-hmm. because they had psychological, physical, and emotional pain, and so do y'all. He just chose to cope with it in a different way. Than y'all did. He gave us the problem. Go on. <laughs> well, you know, so many families oh, yeah. do, like you say, that the attic is a scapegoat, and they are just chose a way to manage that. Um, that's just their way to manage. Mm-hmm. And his addiction is his addiction, but and I was throw this in. There are people who have a shopping addiction. Oh, yeah. And they don't see it as an addiction, but it's their way. Okay. I'm just going out and go spend some money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna Or throw money at it. You know, we'll throw money at cooking you. So you are now supplying his, you're paying for his habit. Yeah. Because you want him out, so you give him money. So, you know, there can be so many ways that the family can be impacted. But go on. I just wanted to, you know, that, that term, family, making their family problem, really bring it home that, yeah, it really is. It is. Um, So let's see. So that, so the first chapter, it talks about being a family disease. And I talk about just creating a new normal Um, because a lot of times family members want a normal life, a normal life, sorry, a normal life. But what I try to get them to understand is that they will never have the normal life that they thought they had even before. Mm -hmm. They won't even have that because it's just like grief. If you lose someone that's close to you, your life is not going to be the same. Right. And it, you, it, regardless of how you put yourself back together and get through the grief and you know go on with your life, it's still not going to be the same. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with the the attic. You're not your life is not going to be the same, even if or and when they go to rehab. And what they have to understand is. The, the addict, they go to treatment and they have 7, 14, 21, 28, 30 days of treatment. So when they come home, they come home to a broken family if the family doesn't get help. They come home to a broken family and the addict thinks it's like, well, I got better. Like, why are y'all still tripping? Mm-hmm. And then the family like, oh, just because you can speak, can, can spout out a few emotions where you think you think everything is all good because the thing about it is with addicts they come home they think everything is supposed to be good and balanced and then they start going and doing work in their program going to meetings Mm -hmm. talk to a sponsor going to therapy and so they're still not at home right i described it this way you know the addict goes and they could really get clean and have really good intentions so it's like you take a bath and you put on clean clothes, mm-hmm. but you go back and sit in the dirt. Mm-hmm. And not calling the family the dirt, but you go back and sit in where the problem mm-hmm. was. Guess what? It's you're not going to change. Mm-hmm. So you know, or you go back, and sometimes even they they don't go to the dirt in terms of going back to their old behavior. Mm-hmm. But part of the dirt would be the family that you were in because they treat you like you're still dirty. Right. Even if you have gotten clean, you're treated like you're dirty, and you get treated like you're dirty long enough. Guess what? That's what you want. That's what you got. Well, and even with the treating like they're dirty, it's because family members have Have memories that Mm -hmm. addicts don't have. Right. So you may not remember that you done towed this darn house up Mm -hmm. one night when you came home drunk. 
or I remember my pain from what you caused. And so I can't treat you differently unless I had worked on healing as well. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, okay, girl, go on. We're gonna forget all the chapters. <laughs> the oh, so let me go to the next chapter. So, the next chapter is I have the right to feel angry uh, because a lot of family members they don't think they have the right to feel angry. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't think they have because what's happened is they don't feel safe having their emotions because mm -hmm. what's happened is they tried to have their emotions, speak those thoughts speak those emotions and the addict shut it down they dismissed it or they mm -hmm. feel like they were dismissed or the addict don't even remember they had the conversation right which is also another memory that i have that you mm -hmm. don't have mm -hmm. and so now you already hurt my feelings and i don't feel safe talking to you about my emotions anymore because you already dismissed it mm -hmm. so i talk about that uh -oh. and then i have to put little tabs on here the next chapter is i mirror my loved one's behavior and mm. this chapter right here it, it gets it gets family members all every time because what i do is i have let me find the i have this chart i don't know if y'all can see it it's a chart in here and it says addicts and non-addicts and so what what i have is a list of words a list of yeah words denial on addict side and denial um, mm. denial on non-addict side so all of these words mirror each other so manipulation isolation guilt and victim mm. and they both they both have them on each side and so what i typically do is i ask the family member i put this on the board and i ask them what do you see and they say uh they look the same i said yeah because you have now started mirroring the addict's behavior mm. and they they say well i don't manipulate them yeah you do yes you do how because you'll you'll say something like well you can just stay home there and I, i'll just go buy the alcohol or i'll go to the bar with you or you know because you're still trying to control them mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Or they gaslight, which is a part of manipulation. You know, and they you can gaslight all mm -hmm. kinds of ways. And that's a part of manipulation. How does victim go on both sides? Because so you know, you have the victim triangle, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the victim at the Let top. You know what that is. Uh, <laughs> so you have the victim at the top, and that's the woe is me, why is this happening to me? Oh my God, this is so bad type of thing. And then you have the persecutor, and that's the one that is like you are attacking them. And you, it's just it's verbal, verbal abuse kind of. Uh, the enabler is the one that's trying to fix everything and keep everything all tidy and like manageable. And so what happens is they become the family member is the victim. Like, oh my god, this is so horrible. I don't understand why I got to be married to somebody that's an addict, and you know this, this, that, and the third. Uh, well, hold on, because I actually usually explain it two ways. Let me explain it the addict way first. That's how, so the addict is the victim because they the victim. Like, you don't understand why I'm mm -hmm. using this and all of this. Yeah, I got a problem and y'all, it's yeah. a disease and and y'all, y'all. Why y'all kicking me, me out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they start off as the victim and then they go down to the persecutor. So. If they don't, if you don't let me stay with you, then th that's all right. That's why I don't want to stay here. No way. Y'all stupid anyway. You know, all of the arguing, the fussing mm -hmm. and the cussing. Then they become the enabler. Well, if y'all just let me stay this tonight, tomorrow morning, I'll go and uh, go to rehab. So when I say enable, they're, they're not enabling you. Mm -hmm. They're enabling mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't work, then they go back to victim. Mm -hmm. So the family member starts at enable. They're enabling you mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get you fixed. I'm trying to stop you from going mm -hmm. to use. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying I'm to let you say tonight, baby, because I know you really go. Uh, we're going in the morning together. Right. That's what enabling looks like for the family member. Mm -hmm. Then if that doesn't work, the family member then becomes the persecutor. Well, just get out then. If you're not going to do it, then I don't want you to be here. You can't see your kids. You can't see me no more. We get a divorce. Mm -hmm. That's the persecutor. 
then if that doesn't work, then they become the victim. And that's when I said, you know, what was me? Why my life got to be like this? This is and that. And then, so what happened? I showed them on the board, and what what they usually see is they're going in different directions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you're going, if you're not on the same, if you're not in going in the same direction, something's wrong. And so I tell my families, you got to get out of this triangle because they're not going to get out of it. So you the logical one, you the sober mm-hmm. one, so get out of it. And like I say, when you have two people in a, in a, in a dynamic, if one person changes, the dynamic is now changed yeah. just because at once. So when that family member, you're the sober one, you're the one who should be able to think logically when you can change that dynamic, which it doesn't mean the other person will change, mm-hmm. but the dynamic will change. Yep. You all said it. Mm-hmm. Give us a few more, girl. Okay. I told you the time to go quick. I know. I see. <laughs> okay. So then the fourth one, the fourth chapter is my feelings, my needs, and my wants. And that one is basically talking about um, family members learning how to have a voice. Because, as I said earlier, they don't, they've gotten so used to not sharing what mm-hmm. their feelings, their needs, and their wants are that they stop doing it. Mm-hmm. And and the thing about it is, it's not just with the addict; it's everywhere. Yeah, it's at work. It's with parents. It's with children. like they just stop taking care of themselves. They stop paying attention to them because all of the focus is a, on the addict. Mm-hmm. So that's what that chapter talks about. And then the fifth chapter is my responsibility is self compassion and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And that one is you a, mean I got to forgive the addict? He don't want to mess up the family. Who he is the problem? You want me to forgive him? No, 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 no. I want you to forgive you. For what? For allowing yourself to stay stuck in this triangle for so long. For, for allowing yourself to stay in this type of dynamic for so mm-hmm. long. For giving him money, knowing that he was getting ready to go and get some drugs or alcohol. For allowing him to come home drunk or high and not saying anything for not sharing your feelings wants and needs with him you know those are the things that family members have to forgive themselves for because if you can't forgive yourself you won't find it in your heart to forgive them true because what mm-hmm. when you start forgiving yourself you realize that you're not perfect either mm-hmm. you know if <laughs> let the truth be told all of us have fallen short of the glory Mm-hmm. But God continues to forgive us, you know. And so, if if we can continue to fall short of the glory, and God continues to forgive us, then who are we to not forgive somebody else and or even ourselves? And that self forgiveness can be harder than forgiving the other person mm-hmm. uh, because it causes you to look at a mirror. Mm-hmm. And when you look at that mirror, mm, that could be a little different. Yep, most mm-hmm. definitely. And so the last chapter is my stress, their stress, and my aggravation. Mm. And that chapter is about the family member's life. You have your own stress going on in your own life, but then you got the nerve to add their stress, Mm -hmm. the stress of the addict, and think that you're going to be able to successfully deal with it. So of course you're going to be aggravated. Mm -hmm. You're going to be aggravated with everybody. You're going to be aggravated with yourself. You're going to be aggravated with the addict. You're going to be aggravated with the children. You're going to be aggravated at, the, at your parents and at your job. You just aggravated, you just aggravated because you stressed out. Mm-hmm. And the, a part of your stress is stress that don't belong to you. Mm-hmm. And you're still trying to fix it. You get That's how people have anxiety. Mm-hmm. Because you're trying to fix stuff that you can't fix. And it mm-hmm. don't even belong to you. Right. Not you stupid. Whew, you have said more than a mouthful. Um, I said, just want to start rolling and rolling and rolling. And it's like, well, what happened? Right. We are, yeah, we're winding down. What would you, what closing words would you like to say? And if someone wanted to get in touch with you and they wanted to find out about this book, uh, what, talk to them, let them know. So I think my final thoughts and words would be, if you are a family member of an addict, don't think that you uh, can go without having your own help. There is help and support out here for you. It's limited. But hopefully, as I push my book out, it will be more. 
because I'm trying to get in the rehabilitation centers and private practices of people who work with family members of addicts to have a family focused program. And um, so if you are a family member, reach out to me at Balance Speaking. Uh, it's www.balancespeaking.com or you can give us a call at 214-396-6503. And if you are a family member and you want to purchase the book, I would suggest that you purchase this one, which is the meditational and this one, which is the, participate, the, the participant's guide. And I wish you could. What? Oh. And then if you want to purchase it, I hope you can use this QR reader or this website if you can see the website. And I'll drop it in the um, okay. link and you, uh, in the um, comment section okay. and you'll be able to get that. Yes. So if you now if you are a professional, you want to get all three because the essential guide is for you to teach from and the participants guide and uh, is for the family members to follow along with you. And the meditational is just a good tool for the family members to kind of talk about their thoughts and kind of journal. Thank you so much. We always end the show with a call to action based on whatever the topic was. So my first point in my call to action is understand that addiction can hit anybody in any family. It is nothing lesser about your family if it's attacked your family. It is nothing lesser about you if you are the addict yourself. Take on number two, take ownership of it, control it. You cannot change or fix what you don't own. So own it. Own the addiction in your family. Own your own addiction. It might be a friend, a coworker. Help them own, take ownership of whatever is their issue, whatever is going on. Um, and I always end with being an educated voter. Being an educated voter impacts everything just like our mental health does. There are laws and different things in place that can impact somebody with addiction. Mm -hmm. How is money in your state going to be um, dealt with to treat you know, addicts? Um, what are, we can put more money into incarceration than rehabilitation. That has to do with how you vote. So being an educated voter it's not about the voting cycle that you're in because, oh, we're getting ready to vote. It's about now. Know what's going on. Know who your legislators are. Know what they're voting. So once again, thank you, thank you for, for coming me. out and sharing about addiction, something else we don't really like to talk about, okay. but it definitely impacts our mental health and impacts our families. So I truly appreciate you for coming out. Thank you. Thank and you again, if you hear the end and try to figure out what all that noise was, we're live at the DFW Behavioral Health Symposium. It is a uh, set, uh, conference for mental health professionals. So we are live and on the scene. See you guys next Have a week. Good night. Oh, yes. I'll be speaking again on Saturday uh, at, at the same conference at the Sheraton in Irving. And it's from 12 to 1.30. Well, I'll speak from 12 to 1.30, but it starts earlier. So look forward to coming out and finding some information Thanks again. Next week, we're going to be talking. I just flew out, but it just flew out of my head. Celebrating life. Life is too short not to be celebrated. So come on next week and find out about celebrating life.